Do you tend to dabble in uh, crypto and NFTs? Yeah, something I really want to get into. Yeah, I'm very interested in it. I want to get an NFT up and for sale at some point. But, but these are the best ones I've been able to find, which have got a serious value. It's a question of working out what what's interesting to work out is how you can perceive value. It's like, uh, for example, how much would you reckon that went for? Couldn't say. Any vague idea? It depends. It depends what it means it to be sold for. It. Yeah, the point is how much it, it actually got sold for. That. Any vague idea how much that got sold for? Hundred pounds. Hundred pounds. Three quarters of a million dollars that went for. Oh, you mean three quarters of a million that okay. that went for as an NFT. <laughs> and I can tell that as well. And uh, many of these have gone for millions. I mean that one. How how much do you reckon that went for? I suppose it all depends on the context and stuff, doesn't it? That's the thing with it's these. The, it's, the, it's, the, it's the brilliance of the art. And I could tell straight away that went for a lot. <sighs> Dunno, a couple hundred thousand? That went for over two million dollars. Oh wow. Well over a million that went for. And I, I don't, whereas this, you see, went, nof, went next to nothing. Mm. And that as well. See, I can spot the ones that have gone for millions and the ones that aren't anything special and that's quite not many people can do that how did you come up with the decision to um have the toaster on the ceiling i just thought it was a really good place to have the toaster i don't really use that toaster I don't use toasters i just thought where is an unusual place to put a toaster this you know a surrealist sort of place so i just thought it's all about things in silly places this place Where's the silliest place you could put a toaster? <laughs> I've heard you have about, is it five or six stages at the 67 or? Yeah, it's been in debate on what you call a stage, really, because there could be as many as seven, depending on, and obviously you've got one there. You've got several in the garden because you've got one on top of the cage dancer's cage and one on the shed, you could say, and then there's the main big patio um, and then there's this patio, so it's kind of like, um, and then there's the main stage up to the Nigel Noise stage, and the in, and then there's a stage in the living room. <coughs> of course, there's the stage, the midget stage in the basement, the calling space. Onto that, this. <laughs> so, so, 
So like everything else, it's work in progress. Notice that's, that's the time and money wall. So they're, they're two peas painted fluorescent pink and a few pounds as well painted fluorescent pink and then those clocks, watches, mainly from charity shops, car boot sales, friends that have donated them. Makes for kind of an embossed wallpaper type. Not many walls like that. And of course you've got the sensory overlay which I'm trying to get across here. You see what I was going to call this room was the the legendary, extraordinary sensory overload WTF, which stands for what the fuck, um, noise art bedroom. That's what I'm thinking of calling. Do you think that's a good name to describe it? I'd say so. That's pretty cool. Best name I can think of. The only other name I could think of calling this place was the Sistine Chapel of Noise. Um, as you're probably aware, the Sistine Chapel is one of the most incredible rooms in the world. Um, but I thought that was quite a good name. It's all about noise art and it's everywhere. There's hardly a square inch where there's not something like a mirror or an artwork or a clock or that's not decorated in some way. It's just everywhere. It's, it's very hard to fit anything in now. It takes, you know, as time goes on, it gets harder and harder to fit things in because they'll hide other things that I want seen. So if the only things you can fit in now are small things. Not much room for anything big in here anymore. But in, and every now and then I manage to cram in another radio they get from a charity shop or a car boot sale. My special time, um, my special time is 7.30, so I do things to do with med med meditation and mystic stuff at 7.30, so 7.30 is, is like a special time. So all the clocks that don't work default to 7.30. So it looks good with the light off actually. To actually turn this off and you, look, you can see all the as you've probably seen in the video you can see all the actual displays oh wow it looks nice the performance part of the noise. So all of these sounds here now are samples that you've taken and... Yeah, they're all uh, looping MP3s or MP4s over the years, gigs or just... One of them is actually a bird scaring device which I have actually playing live and then on a timer. Well, it scares off birds and it wasn't very good so I thought it didn't do a very good job. I was using it to scare off pigeons who pooping all over my patio but it didn't it wasn't very effective so I thought I use it in the in the noise so it sounds good and probably when I if I well when I do a big noise gig I'm gonna have some of that bird scaring noise in uh, in one of the samples of the backing tracks it, that through a hundred mar watt Marshall amp it's gonna sound pretty incredible the bird scaring stuff it's gonna sound really obnoxious Imagine if I'm playing at a festival and I'm whacking that through a 100 watt valve amp. It's going to push people back. Imagine if I got at a festival, there's loads of crowd of here. I reckon I could blast them back with the extreme noise. <laughs> I'm not quite amusing. It's supposed to, you know, it probably repel people as well as animals. <laughs> Properly obnoxious. But yeah. Let's think. That's the guitar I made out of my mum's collection of pills. She was given huge amounts of pills, but she didn't like them all. Refused to take them. They kept giving all these pills, she never used half them, so they were stored in the cupboard. I thought, well, that's what are we going to do with those pills? She, she was going to bend them all. 
I thought, nah, I can put them on my guitar. <clears throat> Otherwise, they just would have been dinned. So they do that too. They got a lot of interest on Facebook. That, that I was in the post. That's one of my best artworks, that. That's one of my most acclaimed artworks, that guitar. Like, I'm actually trying to get that through customs. <laughs> <laughs> no chance. <laughs> Not a chance. You'd end up, you'd end up in jail. <laughs> See, there's plenty of stuff on there which you need prescriptions for. But anyway, would you say there's quite a contrast between the way you express yourself in your artwork and the way in which you live your life in, you know, this sort of organisation, like you said before? Yeah. So I suppose it's related to what I'm like, the artwork, a bit chaotic, far out, chaotic, unusual. It is related to me, yeah. Now it's time for my one and a third pints of water. Some people think it's like my art and music is like taking the piss out of art and music. <laughs> some people would say it was shit art and some people would say it was a genius. Let's see. There's a lot of works that are kind of self-referential like that that, yeah. you know, are still incredibly genius, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's, it's like genius or a bit shit, basically, depending on your, um, the work, you know, your way of perceiving things. Right, so. Would you say that you're trying to make a, a statement for your for your art or a statement particularly? Well kind of essentially it's my therapy. Mm -hmm. The reason why I do this is like my therapy. Not particularly. I suppose what I am doing is expanding people's minds. Because I was doing that in my last great band I was in, London Electric Guitar Orchestra, we were like mind expanding, we just do really really far out stuff, freak people out, we used to like expand, expanding people's minds. Okay? Where did the name uh, Time on Acid come from? Uh, because it's all to do with time and just trip it's like almost like the time dream it's also I could also call it the time dream so it's like you know just saying something on acid something like a really really far out trippy version of time so that's why it's so ridiculously long and it's got such a ridiculous number of clocks in it and it's all time gone crazy it's like a time dream. That's where that's come from. And Tom and Astrid sounds quite rocky as well, you see. Because it's quite, some of the noise, it used to be really, some of the noise I do makes thrash metal heavy rock look like ABBA or country and western. It's so extreme, some of the noise that I make. One of the best ever gigs I did was with the Human Cabbages in Coventry in 1981. Where the whole place went completely crazy. That's when I was in a. I used to be in normal bands where I played guitar and did a bit of vocals and also played a bit of bass. But because I was no good at n normal music, I just don't have the skills. You can get away with gigging by by just doing noise. Because you can't really cock it up. I was always cocking up when I did, last did with the human cabbages. I just completely cocked it all up. I just don't have the skill to be a professional musician. I'm not a professional musician. I just, um, amateur really. But you see, with noise, you can get away with, with kind of, you know, not being a proper talented musician. But I suppose that I am pretty create creative, I guess. Has anyone ever got injured at any of your... Oh yeah, two people got shot with uh, air gun pellets. Um, one of them got insurance, got 12k insurance for that. But he, he was so keen on the parties, he was keen to come back to another one, even though he did get shot in the neck and they couldn't get the pellets out. 
Um, but the police did a house to house search. They came around five, five times and I've even put a reward to catch the guy but who knows, he may have not even be living there anymore. There's been nothing for 10 years. No injuries or shooting for 10 years. Now the guy who's to have this mad firework guy here, well he's here, he was here last time, he just goes berserk, he just lets off as many fireworks as possible. So some guy got hit in the neck with a, with a rocket. He never came back. <laughs> he didn't, I don't think he was actually injured, I think he was just sort of shaken up a bit. But he never, he didn't come back to any more parties. He does come with a warning. You come to these parties at your own risk. The management will not take any responsibility for injuries or whatever. These parties are a bit risky, you know. With all the fuck, because again, we like to let loads and loads of fireworks off all at once. Yeah, time. I have a special relationship with time. There's clocks everywhere in my house. Everywhere. I constantly have to be what look I've got the time there and that's the radio time. That's tuning into the signal from wherever it is now. It comes from I lose track where it comes from now. But yeah I'm constantly watching the time. Why would you say that particularly resonates with you? Um, because I think it goes more slowly if you're keeping your eye on it. And also because I operate in such a highly regimented way, and structured way, um, to knowing where the time is, is incredibly important. So I do certain things at certain times. So I have to be constantly aware of time. So it is also a very good re logistical reason for doing it as well. It's because of my lifestyle I I'll always need to know what the time is. You see? Would you say that part of that comes from I guess the feeling that everyone has of you know, existential angst and are we making the most of our time? To a certain extent, I suppose it is. It's like optimising. Because I'm trying to get as cram in as normally, I'm trying to cram in as many things as I can in a day. So today I, I have to clock a, a brownie point score of achievements today. See, to keep my confidence and for my mental well being, I have to like keep up my score. So that's why I have to really know time times you know because after uh, there's a certain amount of things i want to get done by a certain time and then of course jobs fit certain time zones you know some jobs are better done in the light some jobs are better done in the evening um and then it's like i'm optim basically i'm optimizing <coughs> What does a typical day of uh, tasks look like? It's a lot of it is just working. I'm working on all the artworks in the house, just maintenance, preparing for the next do. It's mainly that. It's all working on my immediate living conditions, or I'm working on the art in the noise room or the kitchen, uh, or I'm working in the garden. It's normally in that. It's here somewhere on because there's many artworks all I'm working on all at the same time got various stages of completion. So I just jump from one to the other. 